Hi, and welcome back. I have to start this video on a bit of a somber note. Recently, my guppies have been dealing with a widespread illness, and I've lost a number of fish, including our original male, Gandalf. I'll be sharing what happened and the steps I'm taking to address the issue. But despite the challenges, the work of the breeding project continues, and a new genetic mystery has emerged from Cross 18 that is proving to be a real head-scratcher. We're seeing phenotypes that defy our initial assumptions. For those new to the channel, I'm Ivan. This project documents my long-term goal of establishing a stable Snow White Guppy line without relying on direct sibling crosses. If you're interested in tracing the entire breeding tree, all the way back to our original male Gandalf over two years ago, check out my website. I'm slowly updating it with all the charts and data from the crosses I've covered here on YouTube. We've come incredibly close to our goal with Cross 11. But as you know, our breeding journey often has its hurdles, and Cross 18 is one of them. Before we could dive into the genetics of this cross, I need to explain what's happening behind the scenes with the health of my guppies. About a month ago, I started noticing that some of my guppies weren't acting normally. With so many fish in my tanks, it's hard to spot a single sick individual. But when a group of them are swimming lethargically, it definitely gets your attention. The most concerning signs, however, appeared in my females right after they gave birth. While it's normal for them to look a little thinner and hide for a day or two, they should never look as though they have wasting disease with a bent spine. This started happening to many of my pregnant females. Take a look at this female I'm using for cross 20. This is how she looked before, and here she is after giving birth. It's a stark and heartbreaking difference. She wasn't the only one. The mother to cross 18 and some of the red rose tails were showing similar symptoms. At that point, I knew I had a problem that was affecting my entire system. My breeding project is run on a large scale system of 15 connected 10 gallon tanks, totaling about 170 gallons. I designed it this way to avoid heating each individual tank, instead heating all the water in one central sump. Most of the filtration happens there, with some help from scattered sponge filters and the matte algae and aquaponic plants I allow to grow. The system as a whole still gets regular water changes. Because all the tanks are interconnected and within each other's splash zones, trying to isolate them wasn't a feasible option. Even with separate nets and meticulous hand washing, cross-contamination is nearly impossible to prevent. I decided early on to manage my system as a single unit if an illness ever arose, so a full system treatment was the only way to go. In addition to the sick females, another telltale sign was the white or clear stringy poop some of my guppies were producing, which is a classic symptom of internal parasites. I'm not entirely sure how they were introduced. Even though my tanks are all connected, I'm very careful to quarantine and treat any new fish for months in a separate tank before adding them to the system. So this suggests the parasites were likely present in low numbers until recently. While on the topic of diseases, I've also observed a few other, less widespread symptoms. These include occasional red spots, a darker region that forms under the skin on the guppy's right flank, and small bubbles on their tails. I've tried separating fish with these symptoms and giving them salt baths, and for the most part it helps, however, it doesn't really seem to help for those that have that weird, darker region under their skin. After doing some research, I'm still not sure if these are related to the parasites or if they're a bacterial or fungal infection. Since these symptoms are not widespread, only affecting a handful of fish out of hundreds, I've decided not to pursue antibiotic or antifungal treatments. It might sound a bit harsh, 
But my goal is to breed fish that are more resilient to these types of diseases. This means I need to weed out the weaker ones rather than trying to raise my guppies in a completely sterile environment. I'll continue to remove any fish that show these symptoms. To address the parasite issue, I decided to use both Fritz Expel P and Paracleanse. I chose both because their different active ingredients target different types of parasites. Expel P with its Levamisol for things like internal roundworms, and Paracleanse, which is a combination of metronidazole and praziquantel for protozoa, flukes, and tapeworms. Over the course of nearly two months, I've dosed the entire 170-gallon system four times with Expel P and twice with Paracleanse. And for the record, this is not a cheap process. So, Fritz, if you're looking for a potential sponsor, hit me up. Multiple doses were necessary because parasites are often immune to medication before they hatch. So you have to kill the adults and the younger ones as they mature. The medication's labeling says it usually doesn't cloud the water, but it did in my case, which makes me think I had a substantial parasitic load. The cloudiness went away after a water change, but siphoning out the debris proved challenging due to the large algae mats. To avoid this again, I'm now slowly removing the mats. I'm doing it gradually so I don't shock the system, as I believe the algae plays a vital role in processing fish waste. I like the mats, but I need an easier way to clean underneath them. I've come up with a solution I'm currently experimenting with to keep the beneficial algae while still making the tanks easy to clean. I've discovered that this particular algae loves to adhere to PLA material I use for my 3D prints. I sometimes put failed prints in the tanks to provide extra surface area for beneficial bacteria. But I realized the algae attached to them and formed an interesting grassy covering. So instead of letting the mats grow on the tank bottom, my new plan is to let the algae grow vertically on a 3D printed PLA lattice. This will allow me to easily move the structure and siphon around it, solving my cleaning problem. Despite adding medication to the system, I still lost quite a few fish. This included the mother of the cross-18 brood, most of the C11B females, and unfortunately, Gandalf. Gandalf has been with us since the very start of this project back in February of 2023. I honestly didn't expect him to live as long as he did. At well over two and a half years under my care, he was one of the oldest guppies in the tanks. It was probably his advanced age that contributed to added stress during this period. I buried him in a special flower pot I made and planted some marigolds. I'll be keeping the pot on a shelf next to the tanks and will periodically show the growth of these flowers in future videos. Now, while all of this has been happening, cross 18 itself is proving to be another genetically challenging cross. Let's set the stage by taking a closer look at the parents. To father cross 18, I chose a very vibrant male from cross 11. This was a significant choice because cross 11 produced nearly 100% phenotypically identical snow white offspring, representing the closest I've gotten so far to a stable line. This gives us a high likelihood that he is homozygous for all the relevant genes we've discussed in previous videos including blonde-based body color, Storzbach, European Blau, and Magenta. Of all the males in Cross 11, he was also the only one to show some degree of iridescence on his forehead. While not as strong as in our late Thorn, it was a trait I'm hoping to improve on, which is the main reason I chose him over his brothers. I labeled this male as C11BM. For cross 18, I initially paired the C11B male with three females from cross 13. This was another challenging cross. The brood had a large number of unconventional phenotypes with many guppies showing reduced color intensity or unusual patterns. In the last video on cross 13, I was puzzled by the low red coloration and initially thought it might be a lack of the magenta gene. However, 
After I'd already uploaded that video and right before giving away most of the brood, I noticed a couple more females with red pigmentation. This led me to believe the original issue was more likely a lack of the European Blau gene. There also seems to be a separate, more subtle factor at play that's diminishing overall vibrancy, which made picking a female that was homozygous for all the relevant Snow White genes a much bigger challenge than with the C11B male. I started with three cross 13 females who all appeared to lack any red coloration which would indicate Blau expression. The most exciting thing about these females is their mother came from cross eight, making them direct nieces to our late Thorn. Thorn had a very striking iridescent forehead, a trait I suspect is X-linked, since one of the cross 13 males also showed a tiny iridescent speck, there was a chance these females could be carriers for that same trait. Given that the C11B male also had some level of iridescence, this pairing was a natural fit. I labeled these females as C13AF. I introduced the parents on March 15th, and the first brood arrived on April 8th. This made her the lucky female I held onto, and I sold the other two C13A females on April 27th. She went on to drop two more broods on May 4th and 31st before she passed sometime in late June, likely from the stress of her pregnancies combined with the parasitic infection. It was a tough loss as I was hoping to get more broods from her, but she did leave us with a good number. Her oldest offspring are now about three months old, and I've started separating the males. We've seen a few offspring with deformities like crooked spines or swim bladder issues, but it's not nearly as bad as what we saw in cross 15. I'll keep these fish around to help me calculate the total brood phenotypes before giving them to someone with a predator fish. So far, I've tallied 32 males, though eight have died, which isn't ideal. As the younger broods continue to age, we can get a good sense of the color distribution, so let's take a closer look. Right off the bat, we can see that a portion of the males still express some level of red, despite my best efforts to use a female without any red coloration. This is proving to be a bit more challenging than I originally anticipated. To me, this suggests that our C13A female is actually heterozygous for the Blau gene, even though she doesn't show the color very vibrantly herself. This hypothesis can be further confirmed if the males split roughly 50-50 between those that are red and those that are not. So far, it looks like that's the case, but I still have plenty of juveniles that have yet to color up before I can make a final call. The next noticeable attribute with this brood is that almost all of them seem less uh, vibrant. We've encountered males that lacked vibrancy before, but never to the extent where it affects almost the entire brood. This is honestly confusing me and is one of the reasons this video is uploaded later than usual. I figured that if I waited for more offspring to color up, a pattern would become clearer, but it hasn't. So far, I have just a single male who is vibrant, with excellent iridescence coverage on his top side, and even some forehead iridescence. However, he is not a snow white guppy as I had hoped. If the rest of the brood remains dull, I'll likely have to use this male for the next breeding, which means dealing with yet another cross that will have a split between white and red phenotypes. I'm not entirely sure what could be causing this lack of vibrancy, but I'm fairly confident it traces back to one of the first back crosses with Gandalf. If you recall, our very first cross produced offspring with two distinct phenotypes, gray-based females that were either very colorful or colorless. I used some of those colorless females for the cross 7 back cross, and that's where I first started seeing males that lacked color intensity. It's actually been incredibly helpful to have these videos to look back on and notice things that I have missed in the past. The only males that weren't vibrant in cross seven were the blonde based males. 
While this could be a coincidence, as the total number of males from that cross was only 18, I still think it's a very interesting lead. I didn't end up using any of those dull blonde males for further crosses, but rather a vibrant gray-based snow white male from cross 7 to produce cross 13. This mystery gene's heritability is proving difficult to interpret, but I've gathered some data that might help you try to figure it out. In cross 8, a back cross, we had 15 males, 9 were vibrant gray-based, and of the 6 blonde-based males, two or three were dull. In cross 13, the pairing of the cross 7 male with cross 8 females produced 14 males, seven were vibrant gray-based, and about half of the seven blonde-based males were dull. I was working on a theory that this reduced vibrancy was only expressed if the male was also blonde, while a gray-based male would be a carrier. However, this theory falls apart when you consider that the mother to cross 7 was herself a dull, gray-based guppy. Despite my theory not working, I still think she is the main source of the mystery gene, even if I can't interpret how it is inherited. This reduced vibrancy factor also seems to impact the females. I believe it diminishes their colors so much that I can no longer visually distinguish between white and red females. If you look back at the females from both cross 3 and cross 5, that difference was much more obvious. I think this is why I had such a hard time selecting females from cross 8 and 13 and ended up with a heterozygous blau female as the mother for cross 18, even though she showed no obvious red color. The same thing appears to be happening to the females here in cross 18 making me feel that I can't confidently select a female for the next cross. So that's where cross 18 stands. I'm still holding out hope that one of the juvenile males will develop into a vibrant Snow White. The presence of the vibrant red male suggests that this is possible, but if a Snow White male doesn't appear, I will have to use the red male to continue with the line. I was originally thinking of starting the spiral breeding approach here, which would require me to use one of the females, but I'll hold off on that for now. The chances of dealing with another brood of dull males is simply too high. That wraps up our look at Cross 18. It's been unfortunate dealing with the illness and the losses, and Gandalf will forever have a place on this channel. The rest of my guppies do seem to be recovering, and I have more meds on hand if needed. The project is moving forward, and this cross, while a setback, has been a valuable learning experience. If you're interested in seeing whether or not this cross ultimately produces a Snow White guppy, be sure to subscribe. The next video will focus on crosses 19, 20, and auxiliary cross 2 where we'll look at the development of the rose tail shape and the differences between picking males or females from two different strains when setting up a new cross. Finally, let's wrap up with some quick updates on our other crosses. Cross 16 is producing some beautiful snow white males that I'm excited to start using in future crosses. Cross 21. I started a new cross using the same male from cross 18 with a female from cross 16. If you're curious and, well, would like to try your hand at solving this genetic puzzle, you could check out my website at ivansguppies.com or watch the beginning of that original cross 7 video right here to see the original mother I suspect is the source of all of this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.